today on Caught for Two, an in-depth, spoiler-free discussion of the Queen's Park Affair, an expansion for Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. Originally released in 1984 and then retranslated for a 2017 update. Is this game for you? What version should you play? And what rules should you ignore? Those questions and more coming up next. Okay, some preliminaries before we get started. This is going to be a long session. I will keep it spoiler free. There are timestamps in the bottom of this video that you can use to jump around if you just want my bottom line recommendations. And you can also watch 45 hours of us playing through this game, the 1984 version, live on YouTube in about seven sessions which includes at the end a long post-game spoiler-filled discussion of all of the details of the case, what we thought of it, etc. And including a detailed comparison of side-by-side -side reading of some text between the two versions. Let's begin with an outline of this video. I'll start in part one with a brief history of this expansion where it fits in. We'll unbox both the 1984 version and the 2017 reprint, take a look at them. And then I'll give you my bottom line opinion about this expansion and whether it's worth playing. Then in part two, we'll go into more detail on the nature of the experience, what works and what doesn't. In part three, I'll try to give you some more concrete advice on how to choose which version to play, and some advice on maximizing your enjoyment, what rules I think you should ignore, and how to tweak the t new time mechanic that was introduced with this game. And then finally in part four, I'll talk about some game design lessons that can be learned from this and give you my final thoughts. Let's start with some historical context for this game. The base game Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective was released in 1981 by Sleuth Publications. It was a hugely influential game, a really hardcore narrative deductive mystery game, which is mainly about centers around reading. It was created by Gary Grady, Suzanne Goldberg, and Raymond Edwards. The expansion, The Queen's Park Affair, was released in 1984. It's actually the second expansion. The first one was The Mansion Murders, which we will return to in a minute. But this was sort of a groundbreaking expansion because the original box, which you can see here, and the first expansion were presented as a collection of cases, 10 cases in the base set, and so 10 smaller cases where the Queen's Affair, Queen's Park Affair, tried a couple of really new things. The first main one is that it's one big giant case spread out over a couple of days. And the second sort of innovation experiment there was the use of a very strict time mechanic where time is passing over the course of the game you play, and we'll talk about this. Now, you can still get the original version, this version I have here in front of me, for about $35 on eBay. One of the expansions is very rare, but this one isn't. And you'll find it in multiple versions with slightly different covers. I should say, I'm talking about the English versions here, but versions were released in all sorts of languages. One thing to really pay attention though, when you're buying this, when you're looking for this on eBay, is that it was released in a couple of versions, some of which are standalone and some of which require the base game. This one, for example, requires the base game. You need the map from the base game and the directory for the base game to play this. But you can find original versions from 
1984, 1985 on eBay, which include, which are standalone. Just make sure you take a look at the back of the box on the eBay item to make sure you're getting the standalone version if you don't have the original. All right, let's open it up and take a look at what you get. Again, spoiler free here. So rules in some form or another, a little time sheet to keep track of your time, an envelope with a bunch of evidence inside it. I won't open it up, but if you're used to sort of cold case games, that's what you'll get here. Various pieces of physical evidence that are made to look real. A map of Queens Park, the new area that's expanded in this game. You'll need the base map as well. In my version of the Queen's Park Affair, it was released as a contest without solution. If you get that version without a solution inside it, that's fine. You can get the solution on Board Game Geek. Make sure you get the long version of the solution with a nice epilogue. And then I've got here, this was the order form for the contest, but it includes the questions that you would answer at the end of the case. The newspaper archive for these original Sherlock Holmes consulting detective games came in a bound booklet. In this case, you'll find four newspapers, double-sided several pages, that make up, you'll get a newspaper for each day of the case. We'll take a look at the 2017 reprint by Space Cowboys to see how that differs. And then you've got your clue book, which is quite big certainly compared to normal case. And inside that, each of the four days that make up this campaign will have an introduction that you'll read, maybe half a page worth, and then a set of clue points, which tell you when you want to go to a place, what paragraph to look up, and then all the text of the different paragraphs and some additional stuff spread out through these clues. You might have charts, diagrams, uh, illustration of a map or a letter, etc. Lots of surprises in here. So there you have it. That's what the 1984 version of Queen's Park looks like. We'll look at the 2017 reprint in a little bit. So the original version of the Queen's Park Affair can be found on eBay for about 35 bucks or so. Here is the new reprint from Space Cowboys. It's titled The Carlton House and Queen's Park. That's because there are actually two reprinted expansions in this box. One is the Queen's Park Affair, which I showed you, and the other one is the Mansion Murders, which was the second expansion for Sherlock Holmes. So this is actually a box packed with content, released in 2017. Let's open up and look at it. This would cost you about, probably about 40 to $50 new. It's a beautiful reprint. I mean, the production qualities are incredible. This is a standalone box. Space Cowboys has released a bunch of different boxes for this game. They're all standalone, so they come with a set of rules. They come, this game, with three booklets, one for each day in the campaign. It's shortened from four days to three. An envelope of evidence, similar to the envelope you saw in the original. Some newspapers that are each each newspaper for each day is a standalone case, standalone large newspaper. And then we've got the replacement map for Queens Park. We saw this in the original as well. Here it's smaller. And then the directory, which again isn't included in all of the Queens Park boxes. You'll have to get the standalone one. And then a giant map of London from the base game. Now all of these maps are the same across all the uh, Space Cowboys reprints. You can use the, the main map of London hasn't, the look has changed from the original, but the contents hasn't. So you could actually, if you buy the original version of this expansion, you can play with the new map, which does look better and is smaller. However, the directory has changed a tiny bit. 
and so it's a little hard to play. You might run into one or two problems if you try to play the original version with the new directory. So keep that in mind. You could use the new map when playing the original version, but you'll want to play with the original directory. Now, um, as far as content of this reprint, the story's identical, the mystery's identical, all of the puzzles are identical, the questions and solutions are essentially identical. They have compressed it from four days into three. Each day has its own booklet. These booklets are illustrated with some beautiful art. And overall production quality is much higher. But some weird things happened in creating the reprint. Uh, you know, 30 years passed, more than 30 years since the original. And there's an interesting story behind this, which is that the original game, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, and Queen's Park Affair expansion were written in English originally and then translated into many languages. The French loved the game. And when Space Cowboys, which is a French company, decided to reprint the game, it was actually reprinted first by a company called Yastari and then Space Cowboys, when it came, they first reprinted it in French. And then you can see they made some changes. They compressed everything into three days, which is required some sort of structural changes of where to put things. But when it came time to make the English version, rather than go back to the original English text, they retranslated it backwards from the French remake back to English. There's general agreement on Board Game Geek, and I would concur that the retranslation back into English creates problems. There are some problems that are clearly inadvertent mistakes and bugs, some names that got translated wrong. Occasionally, it's an important and problematic bug mistake in the translation. And then there is a lot of grammatical, awkward sounding stuff in the English reprint. The details are all the same. They haven't tried to fix any of the mystery, any of the core stuff, but you will encounter awkwardness in this new version, which is a shame since it's so highly produced and so much better looking. But I'll give you my thoughts on that in the advice section and in my bottom line. And we'll talk about what does the move from four days to three really do for you? Does it decrease the experience? You can see it's still quite a big set of, I mean, it, it's significantly longer than your normal Sherlock Holmes consulting detective case. Okay, let's jump to the punchline. I'll give you my bottom line thoughts and then we'll go into more discussion about all this. This is, I believe, the most demanding of all the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective expansions, suitable only for the most experienced Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective players who are really wanting a truly challenging test of their stamina, their real-world stamina, and their note-taking ability. It is one, one case, really, with tons of detail that feels like you're sort of being thrown into 10 cases mixed all into one. You can probably expect 10 to 25 hours of gameplay depending on whether you play more in a completionist mode and cheat the rules and read more, which is what I'm going to suggest. But it's a long experience. There is some very high quality writing and some great scenes, especially in the original version, which is the version 
I recommend you play, but do note that you will need to either get the standalone version of this expansion or have the original base game so that you're using the directory from the original version. Importantly, I don't think you should play with the rules as written. That's because of the time mechanic rules. I will spend some significant time talking about that in my advice section later. And as is normal when playing these old versions of these games, you should expect some occasional small bugs. If, you're, if you really have a problem with that kind of thing, then this might not be the game for you. Okay, let's begin part two. I'll spend a little bit more time talking at length about my impressions of the game, the overall experience. Most of my comments will hold for both versions of the game, but most of my experience is with the original 1984 version, so that's what I'll be focusing on. Let's start by talking about the quality of the writing. These Sherlock Holmes consulting detective games are really like reading a book, and so the quality of the writing is of utmost importance. In the Queen's Park Affair, we've got sporadically some very high quality writing. It's not, all of the writing is good. Some of it is particularly compelling and engaging and elegantly written. There are some great scenes with humor and subtlety and some real personality shining through, especially and unusually for these cases with regard to the protagonist, to Wiggins, who's sort of the Sherlock Holmes' assistant, Baker Street Irregulars, the head of the Baker Street Irregulars, who is solving this case. You're not playing as Sherlock Holmes in this case. You're playing as Wiggins and the Irregulars. There's real focus on him and his personality and him as he interacts with characters in this world. His, his parts are written very compellingly. On the other hand, this is possibly one of the weaker sets weaker experiences in terms of the how interesting and compelling the other characters in the mystery are. There's a lot of sort of generic names and people without much personality who you rarely interact with in a meaningful way and rarely interact with each other or talk about each other. In terms of the best, comparing to the best Sherlock Holmes consulting detective, I'd say there's less rich, engaging scenes and situations than the best of those. And for my taste, at least, and there's a little bit of a lack of variety in the lengths of the scenes and maybe a noticeable lack of really super long scenes, which I've come to expect in some of the larger expansions. So sort of not so many moments where you're reading three pages of text to really have one scene pop out and be amazing. Let's talk a little bit more about the sort of campaign nature of this game. It takes place over four game days in the original three, compressed into three in the reprint. Each day begins with a sort of half-page introduction and a description of some new events that have happened. It's very cool to have these new events unfold at the beginning of each day. You really look forward to seeing what's going to happen. And the pace in this game of new information, new clues, is the highest of any of these Sherlock Holmes consulting detective experiences. There's just a fire hose of new facts coming out and each day you're sort of knocked over by what has changed, what has happened. Um, and there's a real sense of time passing. Things are happening in this world and on each day, you've got a chance to revisit all the locations and people and your allies that you've talked to on the previous day. They don't all change. In the new version, you won't have a way to find out what's changed other than to go there. 
In the old version, in the original, there makes use of these coup point lists where to go decide where to go, you do a two point lookup. First, you decide what neighborhood and location you want to go to. Then you consult a chart, which tells you which paragraph to read. So with the original version, you can compare if you want to sort of cheat and see what locations have changed. In the new version, each booklet is arranged by neighborhood and location. So when you want to go somewhere, you just turn to that location in that day's booklet. So when you go to the next day, if you want to go to someone's house, you want to see if they're going to say something different on day two, the only way to find that out is by actually going to that page in the clue book and reading it. And it'll tell you if it's changed or it'll be, they'll, it'll be missing and you'll just have to assume nothing has changed. So I said that one of the experiences of playing this game is sort of being hit by a fire hose of information and changes every day and just a flood of new information. It doesn't always work. Um, there is a real sense in terms of pacing of being overloaded with names and facts. This game starts out by flooding you with a whole bunch of very generic people that are very similar in their occupations, their standing in life. It's just, and they're sort of bit players. It can feel very overwhelming and sort of um, less engaging emotionally when you're sort of hit by this huge amount of information that you have to sort of whittle your way through. There is a noticeable lack of sort of pacing of information delivery. So typically in the best of these games, we get these bottlenecks where you've got a bunch of different information. You're deciding where to go in what order. It's sort of exciting. And then you chase down those leads and you inevitably find yourself in a place where you don't know what to do next. You sort of run out of leads and you have to sit back catch your breath and say, hmm, how could we, we're stuck. We don't know how to get more information on this person or this subject. What could we do? Where could we go? Is there something we missed that might suggest where we could uncover a new tranche of information? And when you do find that, you open up this bottleneck and now you're in a new world with new clues and new locations. That doesn't really happen here. It's just a constant flood of facts and information, like a totally open world. And it's very hard to get your bearings and sort of keep everything in your working memory. You have to take really good notes for this, but even with good notes, it often feels like it's just too much coming at you too fast. You don't have time to appreciate it. The other thing that's interesting here is that Depending on your style and what you like about this game, you're going to get different things out of it. For me, a huge part of playing Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is sort of the what I call the time travel tourism. Just walking around this world, talking to people about their professions, about the history, about London, all that stuff, about the, the time you're in the 1800s, etc. Here, while there are some good scenes, there's almost nothing, there's almost no sort of tourism here. Every place you go is related to your case. There's very little interest here in making interactions and paragraphs and characters that are just there for the enjoyment. You will encounter some historical facts and some words you don't know that are out of time, don't no longer used. But everything seems like it's about your case. And that's a little bit of a miss for me. I like the feeling of being able to have some little side stories or fun, just talking to someone, finding someone in the newspaper, talking to them just for the fun of it, for some interesting news story to hear about it. Here, it's just all focused. It's all work. You're working from morning to night in this game. And, uh, you don't really have time to catch your breath. And as I said before, the other thing I really did miss in terms of pacing and is a little bit more variety in terms of some longer scenes and shorter scenes, but there were some good scenes here. I said this game feels like work. I mean, 
all of these detective games, mystery games are work in some sense, but it's enjoyable work where you're sinking your teeth into a mystery that's really perplexing. Let's talk a little bit about the nature of the work here. One of the things that's unusual is in addition to having various sort of evidence inside the clue book, like some diagrams of something or a handwritten letter inside the clue book, this game actually came with an envelope of facsimile documents. It's almost like the precursor to some of our cold case games. So you open up the envelope in the beginning and you're getting going to get some documents, a small set, five or six, of actual documents that you can look at and examine and feel and try to make sense of. That's quite fun. Although they could have just been printed in the book. There's nothing really phenomenal about them or important about them being separate documents. It just gives you a little bit more feel of realism. I should say that the original set of evidence in that envelope is a little bit better, a little bit more believable, realistic than the new reprint. The newspapers in this case are good. They're not nearly as overwhelming, I guess, is the way to describe how some of the newspapers in Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective can be. Occasionally in other boxes, we get newspapers that are just really dense with sort of international stories that you know 99% is not related to your case, but you just sort of have to slog through it. These newspapers are a little more entertaining and um, quick, concise, or um, you don't feel like it's work going through the newspapers. There are some real interesting sort of puzzles in this case. I'm not going to spoil it by going into the detail of the nature of them, but some of them are very good, very compelling, very fun. And then there's a few of them, a set of them, that belong to the same family that are represent a real, a substantial, a huge amount of sort of brute force work looking for needles in haystacks, in multiple haystacks, with very little guidance and which will require some distinctly unpleasant amount of brute force work. Without giving anything away, the reprint actually makes this a little more palatable. It's probably the only or one of the small number of things that the reprint does better. But you have to be prepared for some of that brute force work if you play, well, either version, you really have to go through that, but the original is a little more taxing. There are, however, some very cool aha moments while you're playing this game where you get some little foreshadowing about some mystery some, and you chew on it and you get a little bit more, a little bit more, and then occasionally you go, aha, okay, now it makes sense. So there are some wonderful moments of that in this big, long experience. Some people play these games for, they care mostly about the mystery of getting a fair mystery that's gonna test their deductive skills and they really care that that ending solution is tight and convincing and compelling and fair. And some people play these games mainly for the reading and the narrative and the psychology of dealing with these people. And some people are in between. For me, I'm more about the journey than the end. So if I really care about having that experience of trying to solve the mystery, but I care a lot about the writing and the psychology and emotional engagement. And if the end solution feels a little unfair, a little hard to believe, if I don't agree with it, if I think my solution was better, that's okay with me. In this expansion, I think what we've got is a very provocative core mystery that defies explanation from start to end. So it really is very compelling and very challenging. And if you've got someone who can play it with you who likes talking about theories and saying, well, that doesn't quite make sense or does this theory work? Where does it break down? Where could we go to resolve it? That is here from start to finish. You will be perplexed and you will be running through possibilities in your head. 
On the other hand, the sort of cast of characters here, the details of their lives, are some of the least compelling and comprehensible of these expansions and base games. So the result is sort of a mismatch in that the core mysteries are compelling, but you're fighting against the fact that you have very little psychological investment in these characters, very little emotional engagement. You don't really care about these people. You don't quite understand what's motivating them and how their world works. And you're just you don't care so much about what happens. And there's a little bit of feeling like the rug's getting pulled out from under you in terms of which mysteries you're trying to focus on, which are important and what characters are central. So it's a little bit of a miss there. As far as the sort of final solution, the questions and then reading the answers, how satisfying that is. I think even after you play this entire case, if you read everything in this book, every single word, I think when you get to the end and you try to answer those final questions, they really do require you to make some leaps of faith, leaps of logic, suspension of disbelief, and sort of choosing among the possible explanations what you think is the most likely reconstruction of the facts. That's different than some of these cases. Some of the authors of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Cases, like one of my favorite boxes, The Baker Street Irregulars by Dave Neal, adopt a slightly different approach, which is that if you read everything, if you managed to find everything and read it all, you would have a good idea of how to answer every question. You'd be fairly confident in your answering of those questions. Here, the questions are good, they're compelling, they're interesting, but you won't be able to answer them definitively. You will, there are missing pieces of the puzzle that the game does not give you, even if you read everything, and you will have to use your best judgment to answer the questions. I played it, I played it with some friends here on YouTube, and we did get them right, we did feel good. We did have to struggle and debate uh, when it came to answering those questions. So for us, the balance was struck. The difficulty of the questions was there and it was a satisfying solution. We, our little final guesses ended up being correct, but your group could hit it differently. You could get to the end of this case, especially if, if you don't read everything where you feel like a question is unfair, like there's no way to know the answer to this question. It could have gone a bunch of different ways and you guess a different way than the authors had in mind and you might, that might rub you the wrong way. On the other hand, if you really try to read everything and spend all and really invest yourself into trying to solve every little piece, you may feel like the game overstays its welcome and is frustrating in that you can't find solutions to all the puzzles. You just have to, in the end, make your best guess. So if that sounds like that might frustrate you, this might not be the best, best box for you. Here we are in part three. I'm gonna give you some advice how I think you could get the most out of this game and what version to play and what rules to bend or break. Okay, I think if you've listened so far, you can tell I think your best bet is to play the original 1984 version for a couple reasons. The main one is that the, well, let's not say the main one. They're, two, they're equally important, two, two reasons. One is the writing is better, significantly better, with significantly less grammatical errors. The language is more authentic, it sounds more natural English, and period English, whereas the original frequently, even when there aren't grammatical errors, there are things that sound like they're out of time and place. It's very hard to get that 1800s dialogue right. It feels better here. Um, the other main reason to prefer this one is that it is a longer experience. It is, and it's a longer experience, which is work, but 
if you're not in it for a long, epic, exhausting experience, then you shouldn't be playing this expansion, period. You should only be playing this if you're looking for that marathon feeling of being exhausted when you get to the end and wanting just a huge amount of content and reading and mystery solving. So if that's what you're in for, it seems like you should prefer the longer, bigger one. It has more text to read, more interesting scenes, more newspapers, etc. There are some downsides to playing the original version you won't get the high production quality with the extra illustrations here. The sort of brute for the worst of the brute force work, finding a needle in a haystack is more unpleasant in this original than it is here. It's only one small part of the game, but it is, um, it is true. And then depending on your play style, it'll either be a positive or a negative that the original version has these clue point lists where you can see easily at a glance what locations have changed over the different courses of the days. If you're like me, you're a completionist and you wanna make sure you read everything, then actually this is better, the original with the clue point list. But the new version is might be better for the really hardcore detective, people who don't want anything leaked, doesn't, don't want any information or hints about when they should re go back to a place or not. That's all hidden from you here. Um, and the other thing is that I guess if you really are a completionist, if you want to go to every place, it's going to be much less fun in this version because you'll have to keep going back to places that probably don't change each day just to find out if they've changed. All right, so that's why I come down on the original. Your mileage may vary. Let's spend a little bit of time discussing in depth the time mechanic that was added to this expansion. It's quite interesting because I'll talk about Gumshoe, the giant epic spin-off inspired by Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective that seems to have inherited a lot of this from Queen's Park Affair. But this is something that basically was abandoned in Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective after Queen's Park. And I think there's good reason for that. But let's talk about the mechanic. So you can see that you start each day, each of the four days or three days in the new version at 9 a.m. And you finish a day when you get to 10 p.m. There's two things that advance time. The first one is you're told if you travel two neighborhoods away on the map, then you incur a 15 minute travel time. And there's a new neighborhood added, so that makes that more likely. And then as you read various paragraphs, you visit a location, you read something, frequently it'll tell you, okay, mark that 45 minutes have passed. And you could get some very go to one clue location and two hours pass, another lo clue location, 15 minutes pass, whatever, okay. So let's talk about both sides of, both of those ways that time can pass. Um, or, Actually, before I say that, let me talk a little bit more about the consequences of that. There are locations that are closed to you after certain hours, There's some, and some locations that might not be open until a certain time, but you'll occasionally go to a place and it'll say, hey, if it's before noon, you read this paragraph, if it's afternoon, this paragraph, or if it's after 4 p.m., you can't, there's nothing here, the shop is closed, etc." So that happens. And then, of course, the other consequence of time passing is that you're forced to end day one and go to day two each day. You're forced to advance before you've read all the places. And on the new day, many of the places that you could have gone to on the previous day are have changed, and you will have missed reading some significant, some lengthy clue that you would have gotten if you had gone there early. It doesn't happen super frequently, but it absolutely does happen. Now, 
The instructions for both of these games is slightly different. The original version said, hey, play through all four days according with this using this time mechanic. And then you may want to go through and play it again because you'll have missed so much stuff. You probably, I think, if you play by the official rules, you might read 25% of the clues and 75% of the locations you'll never see because you won't have time to see them all. Maybe even worse than that if you really were strict about the rules. In the new version, it's cut down into three days. You have significantly less actual game time, less turns, less time playing the game. And furthermore, the new rules don't say anything about replaying it. So it seems as if the intention of the reprint version is that you'll play it once, read the final questions, try to solve it, and you will have had a very abbreviated experience reading only a small part of the case. I'll come back to what I think about that in a little bit. Um, so from my standpoint, there are, some, there are some real problems here. But let me talk about the minor one first because I think there's an easy decision to be made here. The, when we played the game, we read the rules about traveling and we said, okay, let's embrace it. It's a, it's a clever way to add some opt an optimization puzzle to the game. You've got these neighborhoods and you're incurring a time penalty when you travel far away. That makes thematic sense. So you sort of want to clean up some clues, visit some places in one neighborhood before you move along. When we play Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, the normal games don't have a time mechanic. Sort of everything is timeless doesn't really matter what order you go places, but we tend to play it. We try to role play it a little bit and say, well, we're in this neighborhood. Let's go talk to this person who lives there. So when we started playing this, we sort of embraced this idea. Okay, it's like a little bit of optimization puzzle within this mystery game where you sort of want to be clever about going to places within a certain neighborhood. However, in practice, there are two big problems with this. The first one is this game is already taxing your information capacity really to the max. There's just so much of a flood of facts and details, and it's just all shotgun to you. There's just dozens of places you want to go, and every place you go is giving you new places you want to go that the idea of sort of optimizing your travel really takes away from the enjoyment of this game. You're sort of like, well, there's 10 leads. We're trying to keep them in their head. We just asked someone about, ta about this doctor. And then you're saying, well, but we shouldn't go follow that lead down. We shouldn't chase that lead down because it's in a different neighborhood. So let's work on a different lead. And you're, it's sort of forcing you to do everything all at once, a little bit of every little lead at once trying to sort of optimize. And then you're like, then you're saying, well, here's where we want to go, but maybe there's something else in this neighborhood that we should try to discover first. So let's go to the directory. Let's see if there's any shops in this neighborhood near where we are that we should go. After a couple hours, we said, no, this is terrible. It's really taking away from the enjoyment of the experience. Um, so I really recommend you completely ignore that rule, which will, if you follow, if you, if you don't, I, my first recommendation is you don't worry about going to places near you to save on time efficiency. Then if you still wanted to obey the official time mechanic rules, that would mean time would pass more quickly. You'd have less turns. Which leads us to the real problem of this entire time mechanic, which is that there simply is not nearly enough time to learn enough to have a good experience with this game, at least in my opinion. If you follow the official rules, you will get to the end of day four or day three in the new reprint and be completely confused, have no chance of really understanding it. And um, everything's going to be more unpleasant than if you had take had more time to spend on each day. The puzzles are hard enough that you really do need to see more stuff. 
Now, some people like short Sherlock Holmes consulting detective cases. They like that they're trying to rush through it and solve it with the smallest number of clues. If that's the case, however, this is not the expansion for you. Trying to make this a short experience is a terrible idea. And uh, yeah, so I really do think that the only way to solve this is to spend more time re-reading, -re spend more time with this campaign and not obey the strict one playthrough rule. Otherwise, you're going to see 25% and you won't be happy. So what are my recommendations? I have a couple here about how you should bend this rule, how you should think about the time mechanic. First recommendation I've already said, embrace the idea that this game works best if you lean on the epic campaign marathon nature. So I suggest you attack it like a completionist where you want to read everything. Either play by the sort of original recommended rules of playing through the whole thing once and then starting back at day one and play through it. You could do that. I, to me, that feels thematically wrong and weird that you're going to play through day one, day two, day three, day four, and then you go back and play one again. That just feels like it would be discombobulating. So my suggestion is that you essentially play one, play day one until you go everywhere you want to go. There's two ways you could do that. You could either do what we did, which is we sort of kept track of loose time. It's fiddly. It you think you think that the thing says 45 minutes, add 45 minutes. It is it is not so easy to remember how much time has passed, to remember to add that each time. It is a pain and you're trying to keep other notes. So I would suggest you relax about the time mechanic. If you want to keep track of time roughly, just roughly approximate time passing. The way we played it was we said, we're going to roughly keep track of time. We threw out the travel time. We didn't ever incur any penalty to traveling. We just ignored that 15 minute rule. And then when we went to a place, if it said 15 minutes passed, we would add that whatever. We just try to keep approximate time. And then when we got to 10 p.m., we said, okay, now our detectives are working overtime. It's evening. They're going to make late night phone calls and visits. And we let ourselves take as much time as we want going to every location that we wanted to on the, each day until we ran out. No more places to go. Then we advanced to the next day. Now, because we did keep track of rough time that was passing and didn't allow ourselves to ever go back in time, we occasionally got to a place that was closed or said, hey, if you got here before 4 p.m., read this, but it's now, in our case, 4 a.m., then we didn't allow ourselves to read it. That didn't happen very often, so it was not a big deal. That's the way we played it. I think that works fine. And then those few locations, clues that we didn't read during the course of the game, we did allow ourselves to go back and read through everything at the end as a completionist move, but you can decide whether you want to do that or not. The other way you could play this, I think, is that you could play it and completely ignore the time mechanic completely, like not keep track of what time it is. And when you get to a page that says, hey, if it's before noon, read this, and if it's afternoon, read this, you could allow yourself to read both. There are some threads asking about this on Board Game Geek because the time mechanic is something that quite a few Sherlock Holmes consulting detective players do not like. The general advice seems to be on Board Game Geek from people who've played it is that you can't throw out the time mechanic because it's important in some cases. Like you could miss something important. It rewards you for going there. I think I disagree. I don't think there's anything really critical there. Um, if, you, if you're the kind of person who gets really bothered with the idea of cheating, like I'm cheating, I stole a little bit away from me and I don't feel good about it and the whole experience is ruined, then don't. Then don't cheat. Don't do any of this. But for me, I think the experience of reading and experiencing everything is much more important than strictly following the time limits. And I don't think personally anything really breaks by ignoring the time stuff. 
I think if you attack it in this way of playing a day until you read everything, you probably can expect a 10 to 25 hour total experience, depending on how much time you spend thinking and talking, etc. The last thing that you might want to consider if you're playing the original version is if you want to cheat and compare the clue sheets for each day to see what locations change. Again, my, from my perspective, there is so much work in this game, so much information overload, and everything is difficult enough that I was fine with doing that. So that meant being able to identify on each day, here are the places we need to go to today because they're gonna to change tomorrow, right? Something's gonna happen in some event that's gonna change a location. Now, even when you do that, there are plenty of places you'll go to, it'll have a changed entry and it's just a rewording of it or whatever. But the nice thing about doing that is you spread the clue points, you spread your experience over the course of those four days. Because if a place, if you're looking at your current day, let's say day one, you're looking at your clue points, you've gone and circled all the ones that are changing on day two, then you, you can avoid going to places that are gonna be the same, that are gonna have the same paragraph on the next day. So that has a nice advantage of sort of spreading out the enjoyment, spreading out the reading over the course of four days. And it gives you a little bit of feel of staying within the time frame of the game rather than going to every clue. So we don't try to go to every clue on each day. We just make sure we go to all the clues we care about and all the clues that will change before they change the next day we go to them. That's how I played it. That's how I got the most enjoyment out of it. You'll have to decide what will work best for you. A couple more pieces of sort of random advice. If you possibly can, find a partner or two to play this with who has the stamina to stick with you for this whole experience, whether it's 10 hours or 25 hours, break it up into sessions. Each day is a good way to break the sessions up. This game is so, there's so much information overload here and it will require really good note taking and some real brainstorming, trying to wrap your head around some of these mysteries and specific puzzles that playing it solo is going to be a much, much harder experience. Do not underestimate how much more difficult these games are doing solo, especially when there's so much overload here. Be prepared from the first step to take great notes. Keep track of all the places you've been, what you've learned there. When you've learned some information, make a list of all the different names. You will really have to take good notes. If you don't like taking notes, this isn't the game for you. My Another piece of advice here is whenever we play these games, we do a little cost-benefit analysis of writing on the material. There are some rare games that might cost you $100 to $100 to buy, and in those cases, you wouldn't want to write on it. You want to see it, sort of keep it so that you can pass it along to someone. Here, because you can get the original from 1984 still on eBay for 35 bucks, I think for the trade-off of time and experience, you'd be well advised to just write all over it. If you see something that's interesting, circle it. That's what I did. It will help. It will make it much easier. You're going to find yourself re revisiting a location, rereading it, and making your little notes and annotations on the documents will help you. For $35 for 25 hours, I think it's worth writing on it. If you don't want to, you can always try to use a scanner and scan and write on that stuff. Um, along those lines, I would suggest you, when you read a paragraph, you circle it, you keep track of it, and then when you get to the end, read the questions. If there's any you can't answer or you don't feel comfortable about, or even if you just want the completionist experience before you read, try to answer the questions, I would suggest you take that clue book, go to page one, and go through each page and look for the paragraphs you didn't read and read them. If you do that, you're still going to have a real challenge figuring everything out, understanding it all. So for my money, why not get the full experience? 
As far as the mysteries, the puzzles, the sort of stuff you're trying to resolve, my advice to you being deliberately vague is don't give up on those puzzles. If you see something that it kind of looks like you should be able to make sense of, you probably can make sense of it. Stick with it, take your time, sleep on it. You will be able to solve these puzzles, to figure these things out, to understand at least the textual nature of what you're looking at. Part four, game design lessons. This game was actually a bit of a shock to me in terms of recalibrating some of my thoughts on how to make an epic long marathon Sherlock Holmes consulting detective style game. The biggest take home for me was how much damage was done to the experience by sort of flooding the player with so many different names of people and sort of generic people that were sort of the same. I guess when you're thinking about a detective game, when you play these detective games, sometimes you think, well, that was a little easy. You know, we solved it in a couple hours. It would really be nice to get one that was really hard. And it can be tempting to think, well, the obvious way to make it hard is just sort of give them a bigger haystack, right? A bigger collection of evidence that they really have to pour through and understand. It's sort of like, well, if you, if you want them to find that one misstatement that someone made in an interview and you want to make it harder, well, instead of a one-page interview with the suspect, give them a 200-page interview. That will make it harder for them to find the one thing that the suspect said that was a contradiction. And that's true. It makes it harder. But there's a real cost to that. And it's a cost in sort of wearing down the player in terms of the 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 amount of enjoyment, the amount of sort of little dopamine they get while they're going through this material. And there's a real cost to just flooding them with stuff that just feels like it's taxing their working memory capacity or their capacity to go through their notes. Even if you're taking huge, great notes, at some point you're like, I don't wanna have to search through 20 pages of notes to find this information that may or may not be useful. So for me, the cost of overload here was the real lesson. And the cost to making so many sort of generic, um, interchangeable characters. You really can feel in this game why it's so wonderful when you play one of these cases where every character feels like a completely different quirky personality. And on a very related note, there's a core puzzle piece in this game that is just so dense. There's, it's like tables of data that require real brute force to make sense of. And one of the things that you can see goes wrong there from a game design perspective is it's not just that there's this huge amount of sort of data that the player has to go through, make sense of, and do work to understand. It's that here it's very unclear if there's ever going to be any payoff for that. It's unclear when you found the information that the game designer expected you or wanted you to find. Sometimes here there's multiple things you could find in that data and you never know if you've found them all. And the problem with that is it means it puts this diminishing return on the player where they're like, well, maybe there's some more in there. So let me spend another hour. So the first hour you spend, you get something. And then you're like, well, maybe there's more in there for me. So you spend two hours and you get a little bit more. And then you're like, well, maybe I should invest the time. And that's something we see in a bunch of these mystery games. There has to be some way to convey to the player whether they should be spending a large block of time on something. Whether it's solving a puzzle or a cipher or going through the data, you have to be able to convey to the player, yes, 
it will be worth it for you to spend three hours solving this. Or yes, you should be able to, you now have enough information to solve it. The other problem that happens with this game when there's so many different pieces of evidence, and we see it in other games too, is you encounter something and you ask yourself, do I have enough to solve this, this thing, right? Like it's a puzzle. And you ask yourself, is this self-contained? Have I gotten enough information to solve it? And you might say, well, let me just try to solve it. But that's the problem with making these things hard because when you can't solve it right away and you're not sure if you have the information to solve it, it creates a very uncomfortable moment where it feels like the smart thing to do is ignore it till the end, right? Imagine you got four days of cases, four days of gameplay, 30 hours, you get something in hour one, a little puzzle, which could be critical to you understanding stuff because you've gotten it right in the beginning, but you sit there and you say, I don't know if the game means for me to be able to solve this yet. There may be another piece of evidence that's gonna be the key to solving this, so I'll just put it off. That's a dangerous situation for the player to be in. It's uncomfortable, it's unfun, and it's dangerous in terms of you as a designer crafting some mechanic. So you have to have figure out some way of conveying informally, even if it means like sort of breaking the third wall, conveying to someone somehow through whatever it is, some norm, some convention that yes, it's time to solve this. This game suffered from some of that happening. It also suffered from some philosophical decisions about trying to make a difficult case. One of those was this idea that in this game, there are a whole bunch of little side mysteries. I hesitate to call them side mysteries because we see side mysteries in some Sherlock Holmes consulting detective cases, which are sort of independent from the main case. Everything here is all related and interconnected, but there are sort of, sort of little mini cases that are part of these big puzzles. And one of, I think, the philosophical misses here is that all of these little component mini mysteries, or at least most of them, are left open until the end. That's a little bit of a miss. I think these games, these big epic marathon games work best when there's like little bubbles of mysteries and during the course of the whole epic campaign, you do end up solving them, popping them, putting a bow on it, whatever mixed metaphors you want to use, where you sort of tie them up and then a new one will come up and then it gets resolved. So by the time you get to the end, you feel like, okay, we understood this. We've got that lockdown. We understood this. We've got this lockdown. All these little components. And then the finale, the final big questions should be, only make sense at the end and you should be able to put together your little mysteries as components and have it and then have the enjoyment of connecting all the dots. But when all the little mini mysteries, little components, pieces, characters, all get are unresolved until the end, it creates a little pacing and arc problem. It's, it's a little overwhelming and you don't get those moments of satisfaction throughout the game. And I think that's important. You have to give the player some rewards and some satisfaction for solving and wrapping things up over the course of a long campaign. Don't leave every mystery open until the end. And then in general, related to my point about solving puzzles, I think there's a little bit of a miss here in terms of conveying what's expected of them at the end of the case and what's expected in this world in terms of what is the player, like when we play it four days, these are events happening. And one of the things we weren't sure about is, are we meant to do something at the end? Are we just going to get asked questions? Are we going to be able to stop something bad from happening, etc.? Some a little more attention focused on conveying expectations of the player. What mysteries are we expected to solve? Which ones aren't we? Who is going to be asking us questions? Are we going to have to make choices of actions to perform, to do something? I think 
this is a little bit of a lesson about people who are so paranoid about spoilers and a, a more sophisticated lesson about foreshadowing and expectations. It helps to set expectations and build suspense and foreshadowing so that the player has some suspense that can build because they know sort of what the nature of what's going to be expected from them at the end. Another game design issue here is this question of should the mystery solving clue discovery thing be more of a breadth first search or a depth first search? And here, I, I think that the best mystery games are a combination. So you get some cases where you've got a lot of different leads in a lot of different directions. That's a fun moment. You're like, should we go here first? Should we go here first? And then you slowly whittle them down in an ideal case to where you're narrowing down the, the set of clues that you have left to visit. And it's fun to decide which one to do in what order, which one do we care about most? And then as you want to scale up these games to be longer, more epic, you've sort of got a choice. Do you make the tree branch more so that there's more of a flood of facts? Or do you make the clue pass, the chains of clues and story go deeper? And I think in the best of these long cases, there's a little bit of both. I think it's probably safer to err on making a deeper case where the clues unfold and then there's still one more domino to fall and one more domino to fall and one more thing to discover. Uh, that's a safer way to do it than what we see here, which is a really heavily leaning on just a shotgun of breadth, a, tr a branching tree of clues that's wide covering always, you have a huge number that are open covering all these different topics. It's overwhelming and eat the, the more there are, the more enjoyment gets sucked out of each of those little, little um, trails. So I think in your best case, you want to have bottlenecks where you have this explosion of options and then the player slowly crosses them all off their to-do list, and then they get themselves in a position where they're like, we don't know what to do next. There's nothing, we have no more list of people to visit. We have no more list of obvious places to go. What's happened? What have we overlooked? And then they have that moment where they say, oh, maybe we could talk to the, maybe we've forgotten that this guy worked at this place. Let's go visit his work where he used to work. And then you go there and all of a sudden they say, well, here are the three people he worked with. And all of a sudden, broop, now you've got this nice branch of options again. To me, that's the best experience, bottleneck. You give them lots of choices and then you lock them off at a bottleneck where they don't know what to do and have to solve a puzzle to figure out where to go next to get them the next act of the play where there are more choices. The other thing which is very related to that, but we really suffered from here, is just some lull in the action where we could catch our breath. That's something that some of these better Sherlock Holmes consulting detective cases do. It's very similar to the idea of bottleneck, but it's, it, it's a little bit different because I think one of the ways you can have some slowdowns and lulls, it's like a roller coaster, you need to have ups and downs, one of the ways you could do that, to just let people catch their breath, let the adrenaline calm down a little bit, let the brain relax a little bit from chewing on some specific puzzle, is to just have more places that are there for flavor, atmosphere, theme, history, fun, humor. The lack of that here meant we were always running on the treadmill and it was a little bit exhausting. A little bit more in game design. The use of the clue points and having multiple days where places can change, that is a really problematic nut to crack. And maybe the best game that's got that done that balance is Chronicles of Crime, where sort of there are so there's a small enough number of places and people that when events happen and time passes, you really do, you really can manage the idea of let's go back and ask this person about this new information we just got, or let's go back and ask this person things have changed. Here, there are so many potential locations and places 
that when you just tell the person, hey, it's day two, every single place on this map could, could have changed, could have had new information, that's overwhelming and requires too much brute force work. And then the alternative is to play the original version where you're sort of cheating, looking at clue points and seeing what's changed. There's a little bit of unpleasantness with that. In general, this time passing mechanic, I have never seen it work. Now again, Chronicles of Crime is a great little counterpoint because it's like a, Chronicles of Crime is an app-based game, but everything is done with a little bit of sort of alternate universe way of doing things. It's a smaller scale, but time can pass. The time passing in Chronicles of Crime feels natural. You don't have to, first of all, you don't have to keep track of any of it. So it's not fiddly. It's also using an app to sort of cheat. The app will know, have they gone to enough places that I can advance the time into the next day. None of the analog attempts to implement time passing in a meaningful way like this, where actions take time, I have yet to see it add to the game. It always detracts and makes the game less pleasant. In Gumshoe, which is the other big uh, game in this series, in the, in the family of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, that also fails to work. This idea of having to replay the game multiple times, it just, never quite works. And I think, you know, the De detective modern crime has a little bit of this too. And I think the solution is for the designer, these are essentially books that lean on reading. I think the designer has to assert some more control and not be so um, enamored of the idea of a completely open, realistic simulation world. And I think that means staging the story and the mystery in acts and only advancing the act as a designer having more control only advancing the act and having events occur periodically between days when you know the player has finished seeing everything you want them to see in that day and i think this idea of sort of having time advance so that a player through no mistake of their own could go to some inefficient locations and advance the clock having missed out on key stuff is just a poor decision for a designer. Designers should have more control on that. And then lastly, from a game design perspective, I really do think much of the appeal of these games sh is shared with reading a book. And that means that the characters have to be compelling. You have to care about the protagonist, but you have to be interested in the other characters in the story. We have to be psychologically, emotionally motivated to want to solve these cases. There are some great examples in the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective canon where this happens. Dave Neal's Baker Street Irregulars has a game that I cried while playing. Very emotionally engaging. Here, it's the opposite of that. There were some good, deep mysteries here, but very little emotional engagement with the characters. And I think the other thing is this idea of enjoying being in this world, this atmosphere, traveling back in time. It doesn't have to be feel like a totally open world where you're in everything is simulated. The time is simulated, but I think more moments where you're like, look at this crazy ad in the personals of this guy who's doing tarot readings. Let's go visit him and talk to him and just have the fun of that. Or more historical events going on where you can go talk to the person about that. And it doesn't have to be related to the mystery of the case. Just enough, a little, little sprinkling of those that the player really feels like they're in a book, in a world, living, traveling back in time. Final thoughts here. First off, this is not where anyone should start. If you're like, I want to jump right into the deep end, play the hardest game, no, don't do it. Play a little bit of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective boxes, the normal shorter cases first, understand the mechanics and what it means to take notes and what kinds of things the questions will ask you. Get, your, get some experience under your belt before you jump into this. Play this one. If you really crave that epic marathon exhausting experience and crave the feeling of being overwhelmed by facts 
and wanting to tax your ability to take notes. If you love taking notes, these are the kinds of games for that. Don't play by the official time rules. Figure out how you want to bend those rules. You could start out by bending them a little bit, then you might get a feel for it. You don't have to make those decisions hard ahead of time. You've heard me say that I think you should feel free to ignore time completely if that's what floats your boat. I don't think the game will suffer from it. I've told you I think that the original 1984 version is the better experience, especially if you care about writing quality. Do make sure you remember to buy the original version that was standalone or have the base game, if the original base game, if you don't. I do think it is a very special experience. You really do feel like you're traveling back in time, back to the 80s when the game was made and then back to the 1800s. It is a unique experience. There aren't very many of these games like this that exist. It is worth playing if you like the idea of being exhausted and overwhelmed. Having said that, I think I preferred, I don't think, I know that I preferred Adventures by Gaslight. Adventures by Gaslight came out after Queen's Park. It is also an epic marathon of a case. It takes place over two days, but they're two longer days, and it does not use a time mechanic. You essentially play it as much as you want each day, then you travel, and you play another day, but it's about equal in length. We played this one on YouTube as well. This took us about 45 hours, 45 hours. They both took about the same time to play through. You can watch that. Now, this one is more expensive to try to find on eBay. It was never reprinted, and it's a little bit more of a notorious case, especially in terms of the ending questions and some elements that are extremely difficult. But for my money, the experience is quite different here. Here it is much more focused on a very small cast of characters in a very small scene on a very focused little core mystery or two. It's almost like the polar opposite experience of Queen's Park. And there are some very long scenes here that we reread and reread and reread looking to mine information. And as far as emotional involvement, this game really does it. Now, having said that, lots of people have complained about the ending of this case being very unsatisfying, not convincing, the questions not being fair, the answer not being fair, and leaving them with a bitter taste in their mouth. Lots of people have said play Queen's Park first, then Adventures by Gaslight. I don't agree. I think Adventures by Gaslight is the more palatable experience, and Queen's Park is the more hardcore testing of stamina. But that's even more true if you play with the 45-page PDF patch that Jonathan and Warner wrote for Adventures by Gaslight. That has a new epilogue, a couple new clues, a giant hint section to help you if you get stuck on some stuff, and tries to sort of fix up the end questions to make them better, more engaging, more fair, more interesting, and a better explanation of what happened. So my personal view, you'll have to go on Board Game Geek to see if other people agree with that, is that Adventures by Gaslight is the more satisfying experience, especially if played with our little patch kit fix for it. Uh, but if you love Adventures by Gaslight, you should you'll love Queen's Park and vice versa. And then the last thing, if you really, if you play both of these and love them or love the time mechanics, some people are thrilled by that idea of this little simulation of time. If that's true and you want the most epic experience, if that's not good enough for you, then try your hand at Gumshoe. Gumshoe was 1986 or so, same company, Sleuth Publications. You can find my spoiler-free review of it, my discussion of my advice on how to play it, how to handle the time system here, and a couple of playthroughs of the game. This is a longer experience than either of these, 
put to not put together maybe maybe the time of both of these in here it's sort of 10 connected days of cases lots of little cases sprinkled around here you're in 1930s 1940s film noir hard-boiled detective but this game also has sort of autopsy reports and a whole fingerprint system and ballistic system it's actually really quite a unique amazing deep experience but on the other hand, the actual mysteries are toned down, are not nearly as difficult. So you're sort of trading off difficulty of mysteries for a more um, engrossing and long epic marathon experience in this world. Again, none of these are suitable to jump into and play before you've tried the base games and decided that the system works for you and you understand how it works. If you do end up playing, not Adventures by Gaslight, but the Queen's Park, Queen's Park Affair in either version, I would love to hear your thoughts. Do you agree with me, disagree with me on any of the things I've recommended, any of my final thoughts, anything you've noticed that I haven't noticed, I'd love to hear from you either in the YouTube channel comments or on the Board Game Geek section for the Queen's Park Affair, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye.